I V M. Credit has made paying your credit card bills so much easier. And by just paying your bills on the Credit app, you could win some epic rewards, prizes, cashbacks, and a whole lot more. It's just that simple. So don't miss out. Just download Credit. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. I'm Aditya Parikh and today's episode is about Russia and its Far East. As we know, Russia has hedged a lot of its geopolitical bets on the development and feasibility of the Northern Sea Route, its Far Eastern regions and the Arctic in general. To give us a masterclass on the various issues in the region, we have with us Professor Artyom Lukin. Apart from being a personal inspiration to me and a recognized name in IR academia, Professor Lukin is associate professor at the Oriental Institute School of Regional and International Studies at the Far Eastern Federal University Vladivostok Russia. Welcome professor. Uh hi. Also joining us today is my colleague Aditya Ramanathan who as we know has written about India in the Arctic and is keenly interested in the new developments in the region. Welcome Aditya. Thanks Aditya. Great to be here. So to start with uh let me ask you professor How important is the development of the Russian Far East to the economy and geopolitical uh, fortunes of Russia? Well, uh it's a kind of a complex question, but uh, uh I will try to be uh brief. You know, the Russian Far East, uh, as you know, is a huge chunk of uh, Russian territory. Uh, I think it makes up uh, roughly one third uh, of the territory of, of the russian federation and uh so or uh, or uh, due to this fact alone it's important to pay uh, attention to to the development of the russian far east just because you don't want to leave one third of your national territory um, underdeveloped and uh, neglected uh, so i think that's quite obvious Uh, but but you know there are some very major obstacles to to this uh to this uh monumental you know task of developing the russian far east or uh, again as you as you probably know the russian far east being uh, a huge uh a huge uh, region inside russia it has very uh you relatively few people living here in the russian far east uh just over uh, 6 million people in the territory stretching all the way from from the arctic ocean to to the border to the russian border with uh, korea and china and so it's always a uh, you know difficult question uh, how much resources russia should invest in the development of this territory given that uh, only a few million people actually uh, reside here and uh, most of the russian population uh, as you know they live uh, in uh, in the european part of russia west of the ural mountains and so uh, i i see this as a kind of a dilemma for uh, for the russian government in order to develop the russian far east you need to spend you know billions and billions and billions of US dollars not even rubles uh, if you count it in rubles it will be trillions and trillions of rubles for you know for many decades and of course uh, the money uh, could be spent elsewhere for example you could spend them you can spend it on developing uh the cities in uh in the european part of russia and infrastructure in the european part of russia where a uh, most of the russian population live where the majority of the voters live 
So again, I think people in the Kremlin, including President Putin himself, they understand very well that Russia needs to develop its Russian Far East. It needs to, to have a strong and well-developed Russian Far East in order to provide in order for, for, to provide a decent uh, living standards for, for the population here and also in order uh, for Russia to be an influential and respectable player in the Asia-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific, uh, if you will. And this is, of course, only possible when, when you have a prospering uh, Russian Far East, a region which actually connects Russia to, to the Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific. But again, uh, you, or you need to strike a balance because, first of all, a balance in, uh, in terms of financial investment. Russia uh, is not a, a very rich country. You know. uh, it's similar to, uh, to India, and uh, it has to you know, uh, count its money, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we don't have uh, a lot of foreign investors who, who wish to, to put their money uh, in, into the infrastructure in the Russian party. So it, it has to be uh, the money from the Russian government, uh, which has a lot of other priorities too. So uh, it's, it's a tricky issue, I would say. Professor, one question connected to this that I wanted to ask you is, we've seen some discussions on the Northern Sea Route you know, in conjunction with the Trans-Siberian Railway becoming an attractive transshipment route for Russia and Japan and perhaps transforming their uh, trade relationship and maybe even perhaps altering the map of seaborne commerce worldwide. What are your views on this? Is this something that's feasible or possible to see in the next few years? Uh, frankly, uh, I don't think that it's uh, feasible uh, in the next few years. Definitely, uh, there is uh, some clear logic to, to this idea of uh, making uh, the Trans-Siberian and the Northern Sea Route a major uh, crucial link uh, connecting eastern and western edges, parts of, uh, of Eurasia. But uh, practically speaking, I think we have uh, a long way to go to, to achieve this ambition. Uh, speaking uh, of the Northern Sea Route, even though global warming uh, is allegedly <laughs> taking place, <laughs> but the Northern Sea Route is still uh, extremely difficult to navigate, even though there is uh, somewhat le- less ice uh, in the Arctic Ocean nowadays. But uh, still, the Northern Sea Route uh, is not suitable for regular or commercial all-year-round uh, navigation. So you need icebreakers, you need to build a very costly infrastructure on land uh, along uh, the Northern uh, Sea Route. So it requires, I think, uh, not years, but decades uh, and uh, huge investments to turn the Northern Sea Route into a viable commercial sea lane uh, connecting Europe uh, and Asia. And uh, as for as for the Trans-Siberian, well, the Trans-Siberian, uh, as you probably know, uh, has already uh, been in operation for for more than 100 years, but it has mostly remained a domestic uh, Russian uh, route, and uh, there have been uh, attempts to turn the Trans-Siberian uh, into an international transport corridor. I remember several such attempts, and actually it was under the Soviet Union that uh, they tried to, to attract international transit cargoes to, to the Trans-Siberian. And, you know, uh, as a kid uh, in the early 1980s, I remember foreign, especially Japanese, containers traveling uh, via the, uh, the railway, via, via the Trans-Siberian railway, he and the Russian Far East, westward, 
So there have been such efforts, such attempts, but they uh, they have not uh, managed to to make the Trans-Siberian a major international transit route. And there are several uh, reasons for for this for this failure. Uh, first of all, you know, it's about costs. Uh, and uh, as you know, the cost of uh, railway uh, cargo traffic is uh, much higher than the costs of uh, maritime traffic. Second, you know, international logistical firms uh, are not always happy with the safety and speed and reliability of, of the Trans-Siberian uh, Railway, even though even though uh, there has been significant progress in this regard, and uh, I think uh, the things will be getting better. So I think uh, all in all, uh, it comes down to to the issue of of the costs. Uh, if Russia is able to to reduce significantly the Trans Siberian Railway rates for cargoes, then there is a chance uh, we'll be able to attract more cargoes to to the Trans Siberian, but uh, it's it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, the best uh, we can hope for uh, in this respect is just to increase gradually the volume of cargoes traveling via the Trans Siberian. But uh, I don't think it will uh, it will be able to seriously uh, compete with uh, sea routes. It will only be able, even under the best scenarios, it will be able to get just attraction of freight traveling uh, between uh, Asia and Europe. Uh, since we're talking about the Northern Sea route. So the uh, voyage by Christophe de Marjere in the middle of winter when uh, it's pretty hard to navigate. So an LNG carrier uh, going unassisted to the very end of the Northern Sea route was touted in the Western media as something that is a landmark, is a watershed moment. Uh, however, uh, this another story about to the Nikolai Yebeknov, which is another LNG carrier and a an, uh, sister ship of the Christophe de Marjere. It departed uh, merely a day later on the same route, but it suffered damage to its propulsion system uh, while navigating. So the ship, as far as I understand, uh, took a detour through the Suez Canal and is in dry docks in France for uh, repairs. So, uh, Professor, in your opinion, does this incident diminish the sensational claims that the Arctic is now open for uh, air around safe voyages without heavy icebreakers clearing the way? Yeah, uh, exactly. This uh, just proves point uh, I just made uh, in my earlier remarks that the Northern Sea Route is still, you know, a very challenging route to navigate for uh, regular uh, commercial uh, shipping. Uh, it involves uh, a lot of uh, a lot of risks. So uh, I don't think that the Northern Sea Route, uh, given such, you know, risks and such, you know, incidents would be ready for large-scale commercial navigation anytime soon. Uh, since we're talking about to the Northern Sea Route and we've spoken about navigation, uh, I think we should touch a bit about the digital connectivity in the region. So uh, what role would the uh, submarine cable system, which is being constructed by a consortium called Arctic Connect, what role uh, do you think it would play in the uh, digital connectivity picture of the NSR and the Russian Far East in general? Uh, furthermore, I also have a subpart to this question, which might be a bit controversial. But to, I've come across a few commentaries which say that the Russian part partner in this consortium, uh, Megaphone, which is, I think, the second largest cell phone service carrier in uh, Russia, so would it be a bit amenable to uh, the, uh, the Silaviki? the security forces in Russia? Uh, well, uh, frankly, uh, I think uh, you know more uh, about this matter than I do. So would you just uh, educate me a little bit uh, about this Arctic Undersea Cable Consortium? So is it an international consortium or is it a Russian one? Because uh, 
I uh, have not heard or, or have not read about it uh, before. Sure. Uh, so the consortium is international indeed, and uh, a Finnish uh, government company is actually uh, leading it. So they have uh, signed up with uh, other partners, including uh, Russia's Megaphone and China Telecom. Uh, and at least there are three, four uh, Japanese telecom companies who are also being roped in. And at the moment, uh, it's in the stage of uh, uh, being vetted out. So they are doing feasibility studies right now. Uh, they haven't, as far as I know, laid any cables actually in the Arctic. But to, uh, they they are looking to uh, make the shortest route possible. and. To, this system would actually uh, be faster than anything the northern European countries, uh, uh, the Nordics have put out in the region. So this is going to be the fastest system in the hemisphere, as far as I understand. Okay, thank you. Oh, that's uh, very interesting. And I really should look uh, into this uh, story. Oh, responding to a question uh, about a megaphone and the Slovaki. Well, uh, I would argue that uh, Megaphone uh, is a very well-connected uh, company and it knows how to play by the rules. So uh, I think that by joining uh, this uh, consortium, uh, Megaphone probably received some you know, preliminary clearance from, uh, from the Kremlin and the Siloviki uh, I think that uh, Moscow is interested in developing uh, the Arctic, provided that Russia has a stake, uh, has a substantial, you know, uh, stake in uh, all such projects. And it sounds like uh, in this particular consortium, Russia does have uh, a substantial share, uh, which is represented by a megaphone. Uh, as I told you before, the development of, of the Arctic as well as the development of the Russian Far East requires, you know, a huge, huge investments. And Russia just doesn't have uh, the money to develop uh, the Arctic on its own. So I think Moscow is very well aware that uh, it needs to work with foreign partners. Uh, in this case, foreign partners are uh, the Finns and the Chinese. So I guess Moscow, Moscow would go ahead with this project. Uh, and I'm uh, almost confident that if there are any you know, issues uh, with the Slovaki, a megaphone will be able to negotiate them. So uh, on the sea cables, yes, uh, as with all uh, sensitive infrastructure, they carry some risks. But uh, I think uh, Russia uh, would be uh, willing to accept such risks in order to develop the Arctic. And second, uh, don't forget that uh, if uh, those undersea cables uh, are eventually laid, uh, on the Arctic seabed, Russia uh, will also have uh, access to, to this system, being one of the crucial stakeholders uh, in this project. So uh, I think Russia uh, is interested uh, in this cable infrastructure project for, for several reasons. And, you know, uh, uh, I think that on the part of Russia, uh, there will be uh, no no major uh, obstacles to, to this project. Uh, Professor, we can just stay with the northern latitude. So one more question you can answer if you can. Uh, recently, Russia expanded its claims to the Arctic seabed. And this claim extends into what are the exclusive economic zones of Canada or Greenland, at least what they claim to be their EEZs. How does, this, how does Russia more broadly balance its interests uh, in the Arctic with its broader interests of managing relations with these countries? And how, in your view, would China view these developments? You talked about China being an important partner in uh, developing the Arctic for Russia. So how would China view this? Okay, uh, I think Russia's policies uh, in the Arctic, uh, they are quite reasonable. Uh, I think it's something that you should expect from any uh, Arctic power. Yes, Russia staked 
quite uh, extensive claims uh, in the Arctic, but it's a regular negotiation uh, tactic. Uh, first, you uh, stake out uh, your maximum uh, asking positions in order to uh, in order to strengthen your uh, bargaining power, and then you negotiate with your with with uh, the other uh, involved parties. And finally, you come to some compromise. You come to some mutually acceptable uh, agreement. So uh, the pattern of, of, of the Russian behavior in the Arctic, I think it exactly fits this description. And Russia is, I think, is in very much constructive mode when it comes to negotiating or controversial or, uh, you know, disputed issues uh, in the Arctic, like, uh, you know, sovereignty claims uh, in the Arctic area. So my, uh, uh, my point is that uh, eventually Russia would be able to negotiate uh, a compromise with other Arctic powers. And by the Arctic powers, I mean uh, the states which have direct presence uh, in the Arctic and there are just a few of them. So it's Russia itself, it's Norway, Canada, the US, Denmark, by the way, of Greenland. Well, I think, I think that's basically it. Uh, and all those powers are, as you know, uh, members of the Arctic Council. Uh, they are full members of the Arctic Council. Uh, as for China, as for China, it has no presence, direct presence uh, in the Arctic. Uh, it has, you know, a lot of presence uh, in the in the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> or in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea you know, but not in the Arctic Ocean. So uh, I don't think Russia uh, has to take uh, into account or or to to put it uh, in a more correct way, Russia doesn't have to be very much concerned about whatever, uh, whatever opinions China has about uh, sovereignty claims uh, in the Arctic, just because uh, just because China is not an Arctic nation, uh, it's uh, an issue for uh, for Arctic nations to negotiate and come to agreement. To so that that would be my response. So we've talked about the Kremlin's uh, view and the policy level uh, at the federal level in Russia about the Northern Sea Route and uh, the Russian Far East. But what about the locals? How is China seen by the people in Siberia? Uh, is the exploitation of the uh, taiga a major issue there? The logging industry, uh, it going to the Chinese, uh, say the Chinese laborers are actually engaged in felling the trees there. Uh, is that a problem? And the uh, actual revenues going to the Chinese companies and their uh, Russian partners, is that something that the people of Siberia and the Far East are irked about? Well, uh, I think uh, there is a lot of there are a lot of myths uh, and stereotypes uh, uh, about this subject of uh, of the Chinese presence in Siberia and the Russian Far East. First of all, uh, let me uh, emphasize that there are no Chinese in the Siberian or Far Eastern uh, forests or taiga felling trees or whatever. Because no one would allow Chinese to uh, to engage in uh, such activities in the taiga, so uh, all uh, all the logging, uh, all all the felling of trees is done by Russian companies, by Russians who then uh, sell uh, the timber to uh, to China. So Chinese only uh, only act as importers as buyers of Russian timber, they are not engaged in in the selling process. So well, there are no Chinese, <laughs> there are no Chinese in the Russian taiga. 
don't uh, don't worry about that. So it's uh, it's the Russians uh, themselves who plunder <laughs> the taiga <laughs> in some cases, unfortunately. And guarding Chinese workers in the Russian Far East or Siberia, you know, uh, it used to be uh, a massive uh, phenomenon, you know, maybe two decades ago or a decade ago, but not now. And uh, the reason is very uh, simple. Uh, the average wage in China, in many cases, the average wages in China have in many cases uh, become you know, higher than those wages in Russia. So uh, economically, it makes no sense for Chinese laborers to, to come to Russia uh, any longer, just because most of them can make uh, the same or even better money uh, working in, in China. Russia's economy uh, is stagnating. It's not growing as fast as China's uh, economy is. So there are actually not many attractive niches in, in the Russian economy for uh, Chinese uh, entrepreneurs and laborers. That's why we have seen a steady decline uh, in the number of uh, Chinese uh, laborers and workers in Russia. So I think the problem uh, is not the presence of Chinese workers in Russia, but uh, the decreasing number of them. Because Russia uh, is a labor uh, deficient country and we need to import labor, be it from China, North Korea, or Central Asia. And um, in recent years, Russia uh, as a labor market has become less and less attractive for, for foreign guest workers, including those from China. So uh, for my last question, uh, which is kind of related to the topic that we just touched, uh, so some commentaries in the West have uh, uh, said that the Kremlin's approach to the development of uh, the Russian Far East is very similar to the way the East India Company uh, operated in India. So in your opinion, is this a reasonable uh, assessment and uh, what is the impact of uh, uh, Rosatom, the, uh, the Russian state nuclear energy company, it being made in charge of the development of the NSR? How does this uh, uh, reflect on the uh, region, in your opinion? Well, uh, speaking of the East India Company, I, I know relatively little <laughs> about the East India Company. Uh, but uh, what uh, I do know makes me think that there are actually you know, few, few parallels <laughs> between uh, the East India Company and uh, in colonizing India and the way Russia has developed uh, its uh, Siberia and the Far East. Uh, frankly, I don't see uh, many reasons to draw comparisons uh, between the British colonization of India and uh, the Russian Far East, uh, you know, for for one, uh, the British came to India, which had you know quite quite a lot of people, <laughs> you know, even back then, uh, two centuries uh, ago, India was quite a populated territory, while uh, Siberia and the Russian Far East were virtually empty. So uh, Russia had to bring Russian people uh, here to, to develop uh, this area. We didn't have, you know, local indigenous people here to exploit them the way uh, the British did in India via the East India Company. So, uh, yes, you might say that both uh, the Russian Far East and uh, India underwent uh, some form of colonization. But I think there were uh, very different uh, sorts of colonization process. So uh, I, I wouldn't subscribe to, to this particular uh, comparison, frankly. Uh, okay, and regarding your question uh, about Rosatom and the Northern Sea Route, uh, I think 
uh, Rasatam was chosen as the main operator of the Northern Sea Route for, for several reasons. And the obvious reason is that Rasatam operates nuclear powered uh, icebreakers. Uh, and you can't use uh, the Northern Sea Route in a big way without using uh, nuclear icebreakers. So uh, it was kind of a kind of a logical choice uh, to select uh, Rosatom for for the role of the main operator of the Northern Sea Route, and uh, also keep in mind that Rosatom uh, is probably uh, the most successful among and the most effective among Russia's state-owned uh, corporations. So Rosatom uh, has quite a good reputation for its management and efficiency. Uh, and also keep in mind that the former head of Rosatom, uh, Sergei Kirienka, he has uh, Putin's ear. He's uh, the first deputy chief of Putin's uh, presidential staff. Uh, so uh, Sergei Kirienka, who is still uh, the chairman of the board of Rosatom, is one of the most influential persons uh, in the Kremlin. So I think uh, that's why uh, Rosatom uh, was chosen as the, the main uh, player in the development of the Northern Sea Route. But uh, I wouldn't compare uh, <laughs> Uh, Rosatom with uh, with East India Company, <laughs> for that matter. Yeah, I, I, even as people who are not experts in the Russia's Far East, I, I find such uh, comparisons quite strange to make. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, Professor. This has uh, been a really absolutely fascinating for us. You've talked about subjects that don't really get a lot of attention in India, but they are A, so interesting in themselves, and B, they're also obviously consequential, not just for Russia, but for the wider world. Uh, you've spoken about how Russia operates in its Far East and how that connects with its relations with other countries in Asia and also how the Arctic connects with all of this. So thanks so much. And we'd love to have you back on All Things Policy for more such discussions in the future. I'll turn over to my fellow Aditya. Aditya Parikh, all yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Lukin. And thank you, Aditya, for this insightful discussion. And on that note, folks, we'll call it a wrap. And to our listeners, uh, if you liked today's discussion, please make sure to check out our previous and future editions of all things policy. The Takshashila Institution is an independent, non-partisan think tank and a school of public policy. We have education programs lasting one semester and one year that are tailored specifically for people like you. They are all online and you can take them from anywhere. Admissions are now open for our 12-week graduate certificate program in public policy, defense and foreign affairs, technology policy, and health and life sciences. Visit takshashila.org.in slash courses to find out more. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week, Cred, CN, TheWholeTruthFoods.com, and PayPal. We really appreciate your support. So this week on Cyrus Says, Cyrus had some interesting guests. Kayo Zirani was on to talk about his new Netflix film. And Mayur Dek Chandani has made a new coffee table book about the city of Mumbai, which he came to discuss on the show. On The Wire Talks, Siddharth Bhatia was joined by Dr. Ali Khan Mahmudabad to talk about the Muslim community's issues during these thorny times. 
On the Habit Coach, Ashton Doctor is joined by Sonia Jaas to talk about the importance of fitness and why this is a great time to begin a journey to good health. The Simplified Gang has reunited and they discuss the hue and cry around the European Super League that was eventually just dropped after two days. On Shunya 1, Shilith and I are talking to Gurubad from PayPal India. We talk about fintech, the future of digital payments, and a whole lot more. Really, really deep and interesting conversation about PayPal, its plans in India, and what kind of hiring they're looking to do. On the Millennial Athlete, Tanvi and Shlok were joined by sport and performance psychologist Dr. Sri Advani to talk about mental health for young sports stars. And I just want to again mention some of our cricket shows. The IPL season is on and you should definitely check out Edges and Sledges. And we also have a Hindi show called Kale Niti. Do check that out as well. And with that, we hope to see you again next week. Hi, I'm Zarina Punawala, host of the Empowering Series podcast on the IVM Network. I happen to be a peak performance coach and leadership coach by profession and I'm here to share with you productivity tools, life-altering techniques and real life hacks to help you achieve your maximum potential in everything you do, your relationships, professions, careers. So tune in every Monday to unleash your inner power. Be safe, be well, be empowered.